Barcelona. Now that Stan Lai has taken its seat, <laughs> let me take, uh, welcome all of you to our event this afternoon. My name is Wenxin Ye. I am a professor of history here at UC Berkeley and director of the Institute of East Asian Studies. It's my great honor and pleasure to inaugurate the Institute's spring colloquium uh, programs with uh, Stan Lai's visit. Stan is playwright, uh, director, and also above all, uh, Cal alum. <laughs> And, and then, of course, a great friend. Uh, the, t the, pr uh, the title of his presentation is Weaving Local Stories into Epic Theater, which is about his play, The Village. Now, um, as a historian, I should say I have long been an admirer of Stan's work, especially the way that he invokes history and connects that to theater. Now, um, the uh, Institute of East Asian Studies is also pleased to co-sponsor this event with the Center for Arts Research, of which Professor Shannon Jackson is the director. She, of course, is much more the expert in this area, and I am very pleased to turn the podium over to her um, to introduce uh, Stan Lai and then also to moderate our uh, presentation or the program for the rest of this afternoon. Let me simply remind everybody that uh, this program is been, it's been videotaped for the benefit of, of course, posterity. And uh, so uh, welcome again, and thank you for coming. Please, Shannon. Uh, his uh, epic work, I'll say for example, A Dream Like a Dream is an eight-hour spiritual excavation that has already become canonical in the history of Asian theater and received the top Hong Kong Drama Award in, in 2003. And I'm proud to say that the beginnings of that work, the seeds were sown when he was a resident, artist in residence with us at UC Berkeley in 2001. On this journey with the performance workshop, Stan Lai also became the founding dean of theater at Taipei National University of the Arts, 
cultivating a reputation not only as a master playwright, but also as a director, set designer, and master teacher. Later, he began to transform his plays into film and has earned top awards in that field as well, in film festivals in Berlin, Tokyo, Singapore, and other sites. He's also become a successful television creator, notably with the popular All in the Family Are Humans, and even more recently, Stan Lai has become a best-selling author of a book on creativity that has been widely read by people inside and outside of the arts. Finally, this week, Stan Lai is in the United States as part of his international tour of the incredible work the Village, which I think some of us in this room had the chance to see. It played to sold out audiences at the Flint Center in Cupertino over the weekend, and we are pleased that he made his way across the bay for a visit with us. Like all of his work, The Village troubles the lines that would divide regions of the world, joining at the same time the high and the low, the popular and the avant-garde, the abstract and the vernacular, the tragic and the comic, the modern and the historical, and in particular in this play, the local and the global, the private and the political. No matter the genre, his work integrates themes that are timely, urgent, and engaging in forms and designs that challenge the imagination, and I know he'll do the same for us today. So, welcome, Stan Lai. Uh, uh, Shannon, that was too much. Uh, I, I think uh, this table is appropriate. I really wanted to get under it, you know, and just uh, need a hole to dig into after all of that. Uh, needless to say, um, a week in Cupertino, um, it wasn't at all a labor to come over here. I needed to come here to breathe, actually, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, those who live in the peninsula. Uh, but really, Berkeley is where I breathe. Uh, I always come back here. Uh, if I'm visiting the United States, uh, it's, for me, it's a place of power. It's a place where I learned uh, most everything I know um, and got me started. And uh, um, mm, I think a lot of people can say that, not just, just me. Uh, so I, I had um, these extra days, and, and we really, I really want to thank um, Shannon uh, and everyone who helped put this together, because I know it's the first day of class, it's hectic, it's crazy, uh, and, uh, but I'm here, and I said, I'm here, and, and uh, I'd love to just uh, offer my time and hope to be of uh, a benefit to anybody uh, who, who, who would like to come. So uh, we have such a nice gathering here, I'm very surprised, and I thank you, Shannon, for all, the, and everybody, uh, for all the work that you've, done to do this. So, um, Shannon asked me to uh, put together a sort of scholarly looking uh, sort of topic, you know. <laughs> so, this is what I came up with. I said, uh, this is uh, what I'm doing now, is uh, touring the play called The Village, and so let's talk about The Village. But, it's, it's a loosely structured thing where I think I'd, I'd like to talk about a lot of things. I'd like to start with uh, maybe talking about um, Berkeley and, and how Berkeley sort of uh, uh, helped me uh, create what we are doing in, in Asia these days, uh, and then talk about uh, the village, and then talk about creativity. Uh, so, so here goes. Here goes. Um, how does culture form? Uh, I think I remember when I was at Berkeley in 2000 as uh, an art, uh, artist in residence, um, and I was uh, working on A Dream Like a Dream in, in Zellerbach, and I was so amazed that uh, even the, the cubes that we use were the same as when I was a, a student here uh, in the late 70s and uh, the early 80s. Nothing, well, a lot of things change, of course, but, but physically, uh, well, sure, Bancroft has changed. A lot of things have changed, but not as much as Asia. I mean, Asia just boom, you know, like this is Taipei. Uh, this building was the tallest building in the world for, for a couple of years. I think some, some couple of others have now exceeded it uh, in the mad rush to be called the, the tallest in the world. But uh, this is a, a city that when I was growing up, and you, if you showed me this picture from the future, I would say, no way, you know, this is, couldn't possibly be my, my hometown. But this is the way it looks today. And this is uh, actually 
whoops, what happened? Oh, we lost something as it became a PowerPoint. Okay. Um, I had a photo actually of, uh, of Taipei in the 60s. Uh, and you can just see how as it's the same story in Taipei, in Hong Kong, in Shanghai, in Beijing. Uh, the buildings get torn down. Uh, in Beijing, the whole, the whole um, city wall got torn down and made into a freeway by Chairman Mao. Uh, and then today, all of the, the uh, low-rise buildings are all being torn down. And, and as the memory of those buildings goes down, um, the whole city just suffers sort of amnesia. You know, and, and this is happening everywhere. Um, in, in America, you don't feel it that acutely because the physical uh, landscape of the city doesn't change as much as it does in, in Asia. So uh, this is the environment I've been working with in. And for over 25 years, uh, I've done a lot of different types of theater. Um, this was the first play that my theater group did called uh, That Evening We Performed Crosstalk. Just two people talking for, for two hours. Uh, and uh, my dissertation advisor here at Berkeley, uh, Dunbar Ogden, he, he never saw the play, but as I described it to him, he said, oh, it sounds, he, he, could, he could relate it to everything that we had been talking about uh, during those years that he was advising me. To something like A Dream Like a Dream, an eight-hour epic where the audience, as you can see, is seated in the middle of a performing space, and they are on... Uh, swiveling chairs, and so the, the, the show, the performance moves around the audience, uh, basically clockwise, and the audience just keeps uh, turning and turning for eight hours. Of, of course, uh, we have a dinner break, so uh, don't, <laughs> yeah. To um, something like the Deaf Olympics opening ceremony, which we did uh, in 09, uh, very crazy things like, uh, like these. And again, this is something that could probably only happen in Asia. Uh, these large, I mean, why would a theater director be doing something like this? Uh, but once I did it, um, people who I was working with, including uh, the former tech director of the Sydney Olympics uh, opening ceremony, he said, oh, theater directors are the best people to do this, better than you know, if you come from other disciplines like big events or whatever, but because it is theater. So over the years, uh, as we create new plays, we create new forms because we are inventing the grammar because there wasn't any grammar to begin with. Because um, the choice I had in 1983 when I finished my studies here was to stay in the States or to go back to sort of a, sort of a desert, you know, where nothing, nothing, there wasn't any tradition of, of modern theater. That's what I would like to impress upon all of you is that I started working in sort of a vacuum uh, where we didn't, have, uh, we didn't have anything to rebel against. We didn't have anything to make a revolution against because there wasn't anything. Uh, and that was because uh, martial law in Taiwan had been on since 1949, and uh, anything creative was not encouraged. Uh, and on the other side of the Taiwan Strait in China, of course, you had the Cultural Revolution, and, and uh, it, was, it was a very bad time for performing arts. Um, on, on both sides of the Taiwan Straits. So we had to start from, from scratch. And, and I, at least I'm very grateful and thankful that we were, we were given the opportunity to start from scratch. Because in creating all these different plays, uh, we created a lot of different, uh, I don't know if you would call them templates or whatever, but forms uh, that others could follow. Uh, and we created so many of them because the process that I, I was working with is an organic process, which I will get into. Uh, and in other words, to start creating, to found, sort of to lay the foundations for a, a new th kind of theater, uh, you need a sort of a spirit that is, is different from perhaps the, uh, the normal way you think about theater or the normal way you think about creating things or writing things or you know, being a novelist or being a playwright. You have to sort of shift and change the way you think. This is a photo that I, I love very much. Um, uh, instead of people wearing those 3D goggles, uh, we have the whole audience at the National Theater in Taipei wearing these masks. Because this was in 2003, during the height of the SARS e epidemic, which did not strike America, but which struck Asia very, very hard. 
Uh, it was a time when no one, basically no one left their homes. And there were no public places with, with people. You know, you would, the restaurants were all closed, the movie theaters were all closed. And at the National Theater, we were performing. And it was like, why? And, and why us and, and whatever? But as uh, the thing is, um, this is just an illustration of how fast we, we've come. This was 2003. Um, 20 years before, there wasn't, was hardly any theater, any, any new theater being done. But uh, by 2003, we had a, a photo like this. Because uh, this was in May, this was a performance called San on a Distant Star, in Chinese called Zaina uh, Yaoyan de Xingqiu Yili Sa. And it was uh, performed by, uh, I don't know, maybe you could call her uh, Taiwan's Oprah, okay? Uh, and she never does theater. And she was doing this, uh, Zhang Xiaoyan. Uh, and uh, she, and so the tickets were all sold out in, in January. And uh, as that's also, that happens uh, when, when, we, when we perform. And I was writing and directing. We had lots of other uh, wonderful actors in the cast. And then SARS came. And uh, we asked the authorities, should we cancel? You know, and of course, we expected the answer to be, of course, cancel, because it's ec epidemic, right? And then they said, oh, we've done a study on the National Theater, and we uh, find that the air conditioning system has always 70% fresh air in the auditorium. Therefore, we consider it outdoors. <laughs> <laughs> so only in Taiwan you get something like this, they say. So whether you perform or not, you guys decide. Oh, and, and we said, wouldn't it be simpler just to you know, order us to, to stop? And so we, we had many meetings, and in the end we said, let's perform, you know, because there's nobody else doing anything. And it, the whole atmosphere was one of fear. You know, people were just fearful for their lives just to walk outside. Uh, when actually, we, we, with the facts, you know that you, don't, you can't get SARS that easily. You know, it's, it's not like, you know, you can just walk on the street and get SARS. It doesn't happen that way. So we decided to perform. And we said, we'll give, you know, anyone who wants a refund, just a refund, no, no, no questions asked. And then the office got maybe 100 calls a day asking for a refund. But at the same time, just surprisingly, we got 100 calls asking for tickets. So it all evened out, you know, it's like, and you could see the, the time, like people were so uh, sort of hyper, they, they canceled their tickets and then they called back an hour later and said, can I get them back? And, <laughs> and no, unfortunately, they couldn't. So this was, uh, this, this photo is uh, kind of a rarity, I guess, in theater history, uh, where everyone was ordered to have these uh, masks on during the performance. And the actors kidded me and said, do we need masks? <laughs> uh, after every show, uh, I normally don't, don't do a curtain call, but I did a curtain call and I spoke to the audience and I, I thanked them for coming and I said it was, it was a great feeling that during this time of uh, this epidemic that, I mean, it's like people are, you're afraid of your lives, but you will come to a theater play. Uh, this is a really a great feeling. And, uh, you know, after all the epidemic is over, everyone will look back um, and, and realize that we had this one evening in the theater together. Uh, so this play ran for uh, 15 performances during that uh, epidemic and was probably the only bright spot in Taiwan at the time where people really congregated uh, together, 1,500 people a night. Uh, and A Dream Like a Dream, which I'll get into uh, later. But uh, briefly, I would like to talk about um, gaining knowledge and then this crisis of knowledge I had at Berkeley when I was here. Uh, in those days, it was called the Department of Dramatic Art. Uh, and by 82, I had been advanced to candidacy for a PhD. Uh, I, coming from, uh, really from nowhere, I had no background, extremely limited background in theater because I came from a society which did not have organized theater. Uh, and people in my society thought me strange because why would you want to go abroad and study a subject which did, which did not exist? You know, the, the, in other words, the industry did not exist in Taiwan. What do you, what are you doing? You know, so um, 
that's the way I was in those days, just uh, sort of um, quite idealistic and thinking, uh, what the hell, let's, the, let's just figure out what theater in the West is about, and then we'll take it from there. That's basically the way I felt when I came. Uh, I, I said, I don't, I don't know anything, I don't claim to know anything, uh, but I'm willing to learn. So I learned and we had a, I must say, at least for me, uh, a, a truly brilliant uh, faculty uh, at the time. Uh, just uh, authorities in, in all you know, the fields of Western theater and theater history. And, uh, and they were all here at Berkeley, um, directing teachers, uh, wonderful training I was getting. So um, uh, in fact, I, I was just uh, talking a little earlier saying, lamenting the fact that we don't even have these courses that are called what, what they were called in those days, which was just plainly like history of theater. You know, uh, We don't have these names anymore. We have very exotic uh, names for all these courses. But anyway, this was the stuff I was getting. And around 82, after I was advanced to candidacy, uh, I had a strange uh, attack, uh, a crisis of, of uh, thinking that I'm advanced to candidacy, and I don't know what theater is. I suddenly had this sort of absurd, but not at all, very real nightmare. Uh, I was wondering if someone in the physics department would have the same nightmare, saying that they're going to get a PhD, but they don't have no idea what physics is. Uh, and I felt that. I said, what is theater? Uh, I, can, I could write an essay telling you, but I don't know if I could really believe what I was writing, because I could not feel the relevance of theater to the individual or to the society, at least in Berkeley, in the Bay Area, in America. I, I couldn't feel that. Uh, this was 1982. Uh, once in a while, I would see a performance, and I was going to plays all the time in those days. Uh, as a student, you would you just go everywhere. Uh, you see as much as you can. And once in a while, I would see a truly beautiful and wonderful thing that I felt really had something to do with me, not only with me, but with, uh, with the society and with the fate of humanity and blah, 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 everything. Suddenly it connected to everything. But that was rare. That was very, very rare. I remember uh, going on uh, frozen nights uh, to uh, Live Oak Park and seeing the Berkeley Shakespeare Festival. And, uh, and sure, Shakespeare is wonderful, but leaving the, the performance saying, what was that? You know, did, did that really have anything to do with me? Going to ACT in San Francisco and feeling the same way, uh, seeing the latest Tom Stoppard play, comedy, and just feeling that pockets of audiences laughing, chuckling here and there on different jokes. Um, and I, was, I just felt it was so cold, it was like, uh, where, where is the, I mean, where's the unity? Why can't we all laugh together or cry together? What happened? What, what happened to theater? And what is, what is theater? What is the th if theater cannot give us this sort of unified experience, then, then what, what's it doing? And so um, I was sort of quite depressed for a while. Uh, I think anyone who would feel the way I did would be depressed because you've sort of uh, put all your chips into this uh, education uh, toward a PhD in this topic that you love, and suddenly, it's not that you don't love it anymore, it's just that it suddenly seems so strange and distant. So, um, what was I to do? I was really very, very lucky, because at that time, I, uh, Dunbar Ogden brought over, he was writing a book on this uh, theater group called the Amsterdam Werktheater uh, in Holland. And their main person, Shireen Stroker, came over to Berkeley to teach for uh, two quarters. This was 1982, I believe, yes. Uh, the previous summer, I had met her through Dunbar's introduction in Amsterdam. And uh, I was just amazed at the type of theater they did, which was totally opposite of what I, what I just described. They would perform, they would set up a tent, uh, you know, in a park in Amsterdam in the summer. And about 800 people in that tent, which they owned. Uh, and 
I don't understand the word of Dutch, but uh, I remember at that performance, uh, you could feel how the audience was breathing with the actors uh, and how the play I watched uh, in, in the summer of 82 was, uh, yeah, that was 82. That's, therefore, I was, it was 83 when I, when I apprent was apprenticed with Shireen. Uh, it was about a public toilet and um, the caretaker of the public toilet. Okay, and it was a musical about the fate of the caretaker of the public toilet. And it was, it was funny, it was sad. I didn't understand the word, but I, I breathed with it. And the 800 people in the audience, certainly, uh, you, you could really feel it was, it was made for them, and they knew it. They appreciated it. They appreciated that the, this theater group would make something for them. This theater group also did a, a very famous play called In for Treatment, uh, which has three actors uh, that are dealing with a, a, a cancer treatment <coughs> Uh, a cancer patient's uh, journey, three actors, but designed for only one audience. So they would take the play to doctor's office and perform it in the doctor's office. So 90 minutes of theater in the, in the doctor's office. And, and they changed uh, so many uh, lives and they changed so many concepts from doctors. Uh, they said once in a while they'd allow two people to watch, like a doctor and a nurse. Uh, but uh, they really changed their whole um, outlook on how to deal with uh, uh, patients with terminal illness. And this was in the 70s. Uh, so this very progressive uh, group, th these were the people I was, I, I was looking for. Um, this made theater so uh, rele relevant uh, to, to everybody, to everything, to humanity. And so when Shireen came to uh, Berkeley in 83, um, it was perfect. I learned from her uh, how, to, how to make theater the way they did, which was through using a tool called improvisation. At the same time I was writing my dissertation, which Shannon so kindly spoke about, um, using the now totally in, politically incorrect word oriental uh, in the title. Is that true? Still true? It's, oriental is no-no? Sorry about that, Wenxing, but uh, in those days, <laughs> you, you can see how uh, academia also goes through like, you know, f fads and fashions and, uh, and now, I, I don't know, I guess oriental is still a very bad word, huh? But I'm sorry. That <laughs> it, it, yeah, it's everything that you said in there, though, is... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, I talked about these gentlemen, uh, Basically, the dissertation was about how these great uh, artists in the West actually misinterpreted, uh, you know, all of Asian theater and philosophy uh, to make their great works. Uh, that it's basically a study of that, you know, how how they actually didn't get it right, you know. <laughs> and it doesn't matter because they uh, they they produce these great works, and some of them, like uh, O'Neill and Beckett. Uh, never even knew about, knew much about uh, Asian theater, but wrote plays that uh, ironically were very Asian in spirit, and, and I spent a lot of time trying to uh, prove that, uh, that a lot of Beckett's uh, later work was, and, and O'Neill's latest late work were basically in the spirit of the Japanese no play. Uh, and... Uh, it was fun. It was intense. Uh, I shouldn't have been working in the theater at, in those days, but I had to. Uh, in other words, I shouldn't have been working with Shireen, but I made my choice and I did it. And uh, so, then I went home. Taipei in 83, modern theater had not been developed and traditional theater had been uprooted by this phenomenal economic growth. Taipei was noisy, uh, polluted, uh, crazy. Uh, when things changed, like I went home and I, I felt like there was at least 500 high-rise buildings I never saw before, uh, and streets I didn't know, and uh, elevated uh, highways and stuff like that. And one thing was was particularly on my mind is I went, I went downtown to uh, have my favorite bowl of noodles and it was gone. <laughs> oh. 
And, and I never thought about those noodles until they were gone. Because uh, to this day, uh, I have never found that, that bowl of noodles anywhere in China. Okay, so it had a, it had a flavor and a, and a way of the recipe that was distinct. And I still don't even know which province it came from. Uh, but uh, to this day, that was the best bowl of noodles I ever had. And, and, and because uh, the landlord raised the rent, and I guess the people, you know, they just decided to quit. Uh, and that's it. Uh, and to me, um, this is what we're dealing with uh, on a real basis, is, is if suddenly you leave the country for a few years to come back, your noodles are gone. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, a lot of things are dying. A lot of things just die right in front of you. So the challenge was how would I apply the Western elements I had learned into the, the, the situation I was in. Because uh, basically in Taiwan we have traditional theaters, uh, but not modern theater. It was starting. We had some uh, very, very exciting work being done. Uh, I, I certainly don't claim to be the first. Uh, there were quite a few uh, people who later I worked with. Um, they were called the Lanling Theater Collective, and uh, they, they did beautiful stuff. And immediately we started working together and, and, and clicking. So I chose to use improvisation as, as my tool of, of creating, because I, I wasn't trained in Berkeley as a playwright. I was trained as a director and a scholar. Uh, in those days, we didn't have much, much playwriting class, uh, and I never took, took a playwriting class. So, but as you could see, um, I went back to teach at a new school, the National Institute of the Arts, which had just started. It was like all things sort of fell into place. The timing was right. I was there, this young professor, got a PhD from Berkeley. But what am I going to teach? Because there was absolutely no materials in Chinese to teach. Uh, if I wanted to teach anything, I would have to translate, you know, plays and source materials, and, and I did. Uh, I started uh, translating works. There was a complete works of Shakespeare uh, that had already been in, published, uh, but not much more. Some plays of Ibsen, Chekhov, and that was it. So um, when, it, when it came to teaching classes, I would just be translating like mad, just doing all sorts of uh, work. But when it came to teaching acting and directing and, and really directing a, a play, then came the real test, which is, what do, I, what do we want to do here? Do we want to, do I want to take my Berkeley training totally and just sort of just move it over like, let's say if someone learned nuclear uh, you know, energy here at Berkeley, of course they'd go back to Taiwan and install you know, an American style nuclear generator. You know, there's no controversy to that. You wouldn't have to adapt, you know, such a nuclear generator to a Chinese spirit or, you know, Chinese food or whatever. You know, there's, there's no need for that. But theater is, is live. It's working with people. And so there's no way you can just say, okay, uh, American production system, which I learned here, move it right over and install it. It doesn't work because there's, there wasn't any industry there. And even if there was an industry, I would still question, is that what we want to do? Is there any way we can make our own? Can we, can we make our own theater? Can we do our own plays? Can we do something like Shireen was doing with her group that really spoke to the, to the audience instead of uh, Ibsen, which we respect? But what message would that be if I went back and did Doll's House and Ghosts uh, and, and then King Lear? Uh, what, what message would that be? So I started working with my students and uh, sort of devising plays out of improvisation. And to this day, I still use improvisation as, a, as my main tool uh, in, in creating. Improvisation as a creative tool has the possibility to filter out the deeper concerns within a performer, bypassing the question of form while at the same time creating form, meaning we don't have to worry about the form of the play. We're working in a, in a, in a rehearsal room in a studio we're really extracting the deeper concerns of the performer. And we're not worrying too much about what the play is about or what, it, what it's like. We're just looking for, for truth. We're looking for real moments and real concerns within a performer. So it has the possibility to filter out the deeper concerns. 
So for me, improvisation is a tool to create moments. These moments then become building blocks toward constructing works for the theater, which are organic because they form themselves sort of. As you work, if you have maybe three months to work on a piece, uh, and the piece, certainly it's not just anything. It's based on something. There's, a, uh, there's something like, let's say, uh, in 84 when I went back um, and worked with the Landling group, uh, they had an invitation from a friend of theirs to, to uh, do a play uh, about mentally retarded children. And uh, actually, the, the head of this mentally retarded uh, institute uh, asked us to go in and, and said, can we do a play that the, that the kids can perform? And I said, I don't, I don't know if I can do that. Uh, I'm certainly not, not trained to do that. Um, maybe we can do a play about uh, their families and them. And, and then, you see, then we have something to work on. And then we would start doing improvisations amongst ourselves. And we wound up with like 80 different scenes, uh, all quite nice. And then I would like sort of work as an editor and then make sort of just pare them down to where we had 16 scenes and two hours of theater. And we performed. Uh, and this, this was the kind of work that we were doing. So a special moment is created through a chemical reaction that occurs when certain elements merge at the correct place and time. Well, it's like jazz, you know, in jazz, there's a lot of bad jazz too, but when jazz is, is clicking and working and the musicians are masterful at it and the musicians are, I would say, passionate and compassionate at the same time, then you have some magic happening. And then you have these moments that you, you can work on. And, and this is what I was doing, sort of getting the actors to uh, jam and to improvise. And then the moments would, would, would occur, I would be taking them down and then we can recreate them. Okay, sometimes not so wonderfully, but at least we can recreate them to a, to a, a good enough point. The deepest, most reverberating moment is that which combusts organically, blossoming in a natural way through interaction of all the components at the right and inevitable point in time. Mm, sounds kind of mystical. Uh, but uh, this is how it works, and it, it is. I mean, many people have studied my method, which, is, which today is very different from what Shireen uh, and the Amsterdam people did. Uh, and I've often taken graduate students, in, and they say they want to be throughout a production. I said, welcome. You know, you can just tag along. And I'm discouraged because Often when the magic happens, they don't see it, you know. It's right in front of their eyes. They say, did you see that? And, huh, what? You know, or, I, or I, once I remember distinctly, one, this uh, graduate student from National Taiwan University, he was doing a dissertation on me. And, um, and uh, so I was doing this play uh, called Millennium Tea House. And it just wasn't working. The scene wasn't working. And then I said, okay, take a break, 10 minutes. And everyone out went, went out and, you know, they had their smoke or whatever. But I was working with two, two actors. We, we stayed during the break and, and suddenly it all happened, you know, there. And so 10 minutes later they came back from their smoke and uh, I said, it's all over, you know, you missed it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, sorry, that's just the way it happens. And, but the, the, more, the more discouraging part is when it happens in front of their eyes and, and they don't see it. Is this, this, hello, yeah, okay, good. So it's all a question of, what, of how you use your eyes, actually, and how you use your whole, your whole emotions to, uh, to perceive uh, a moment, to perceive what's happening. And I think I, I need that ability, but if you want to write about it, you have to have that ability too, because you have to see uh, what, is, what is happening um, that is abstract and not, not so concrete. So such a moment can only be constructed through internal means, meaning that the moment is the external manifestation of or a natural progression from an essential kernel of thought or emotion within the artist. In other words, if we have a wonderful moment that occurs, it's because of a kernel in the artist that that comes from. 
How deep or fluid that moment manifests depends on the depth and fluidity or skills of the artist's mind. In other words, anybody can do it. Uh, but whether you can create fluid works through using improvisation, uh, that's something. In the old days, I was, I was always ready to open to teaching my method. Uh, these days, I'm more and more discouraged because uh, I find less and less people uh, are, are ready to, to, do, to, use, to do something like this. Uh, one good experience was at Berkeley in, in 2000. I think a uh, lot of the students really, really got it. Uh, but it's not very often that that happens. And, and in many ways, uh, people, you really have to have a grasp of, of all the skills of, of the theater to be able to do this improvisational sort of work. It doesn't like you just can't walk into it and say, let's do it. Uh, it has to, it, you have to have training. You have to have actor training. You have, to, you have to know how to put a play together. You have to know how to direct, uh, how to direct actors. And if we use the Buddhist uh, um, way of saying it, of cause and effect, uh, which is called karma, which is very misunderstood. Uh, karma, the word is misunderstood in the West, but we see it simply as cause and effect. And I often tell my students or anyone who asks, I, said, I say, I'm a director of cause. And once I get the cause out of the actors, I don't worry about the effect, it just falls into place. But many directors are trained or are inclined to direct effect. You know, they want the effect. They want, okay, now cry, cry as hard as you can now, you know. <laughs> but to me, if the actor can find the cause for the sorrow, then it doesn't matter if they cry or not. You know, the audience will really get it and understand the, the deeper meaning of that moment. So some notes uh, on the way I work. Uh, improvisation cannot adequately define my method. I can only describe it as a, a private, unique performance in a studio aimed at a specific situation and environment. It's not the same as improv in Western actor training, uh, but rather what I'm doing is creating a moment and then occupying that moment. That's probably the best way I can describe it. Uh, maybe in more concrete terms, I will spend a lot of time with the actors uh, working on who, who you are. Who are you? So you would come in, for instance, for the village, which Shannon saw. Uh, the actors would come in not knowing who they're playing, and they would just receive an outline. And I'd say, OK, you are so-and-so. Oh, oh, I'm so-and-so. OK, well, who is so-and-so? So then we spend time saying, OK, we, we spend time really putting together a biography of this, uh, of this character. So it's sort of inverting the way that uh, actors are trained in, in let's say, um, the Stanislavski style, the method, which I respect very much. Uh, but, and I was trained that way. So if, you, if you're acting in a play, you have a role, then you create a biography for that role. But what I'm doing is before the script is written, before the lines are written, before the play is written, then we are creating the biography of the role. So once that bi biography is created, and we don't just do it lightly, we, we discuss it, you know, the actor will come in and say, okay, uh, I have a biography here. And I will say, okay, oh, so you think you were born in a certain place? I don't think you were born there. And then, and then he'll say, why? And I'll, we'll, you know, it's, it's like, let's say we wanna do a character here, and, and, and then the actor will say, well, I was born in Berkeley. And I say, no, you were born in Los Angeles. Why? Okay, and I'll tell him why. And then maybe we'll meet halfway or something like that. <laughs> so Stockton or something like that, you know. <laughs> but, but it always leads to discussion, which always gets us deeper and deeper into the character, which sounds absurd because we don't have a play, right? But this is the way we do it. We start creating the characters, and as we create, we have an idea about the play, but talking about the characters gives us a better idea about the play. And then, I will, once the, the characters are, are, are ready, the actors are ready, I will put them into situations where they just have to interact with each other. So that's in the outline. So let's say someone, something happened, you know, like in the village, uh, I will have them 
uh, have an argument about a, a, a broken window pane and just go. And they know who they are and they know what happened with the window and so they just go. And, we're, and, and in these, this day and age, I have the luxury of having uh, stenographers. You know, I have my students who are just taking it all down and thank God we have uh, Windows messaging these days so they're all very fast with, uh, <laughs> with uh, taking down all the dialogue. They take down all the dialogue I get it in the evening, I edit it, and if it works, the next day they have a scene. I just, we just print it out and then they have a scene there. And when it works, it's very fast. Uh, we're very efficient with it. Uh, in the old days, it would take me half a year to do a play. Now, like The Village, it took only two months. Uh, so uh, this, basically, that's the way to do it. Uh, build the characters, um, have a good outline, put them into the situations of the outline, and then sort of, it's like you set up the bones and then the flesh starts growing and then it all grows, grows and you have your play. It sounds easy. And <laughs> so the main method used to occupy a moment is just letting go. You surrender to the truth of that moment. So when the two actors are asked to react or interact about a broken window pane, they can't be uh, trying to design their dialogue. They can't be thinking of smart things to say. They just have to surrender to the moment and just go. And I will be helping them doing that. Uh, and if they're not into that mood, I will stop and we'll take a break and we'll start it again. It requires courage and also technique. The actor has to be able to, because if you surrender yourself as an actor, just like a jazz musician, you're vulnerable. You're very vulnerable. You, you're exposing yourself. Uh, when I ask you to just let yourself go to that moment, then who knows what comes from, you know, and you have to trust your director, you have to trust your actor, your fellow actors. You never know what's gonna happen. So you need courage and you also need technique. Technique meaning you know what I'm looking for and I don't even know what I'm looking for, right? So how do you know what I'm looking for? But yes, you sort of know what I'm looking for. I sort of know what I'm looking for. Then we move together. How to manage all these moments that come from that moment is another question. That's when I become a sort of a playwright playwright and not, and not a, someone working with improvisation in a room. This afternoon, uh, I heard on this, the jazz radio station here, they were interviewing someone. I, I didn't get the name, I'm sorry, but they were also talking about improvisation. And I, I just laughed so hard when, when uh, the moderator said, can you explain what the process is? And this jazz musician said, the process is to be there. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it summed it up really well. Uh, yeah. You have to be there. The student who didn't get it wasn't there. I mean, the body was there, the, the mind wasn't there. So, to truly improvise, one must rid oneself of preconceptions, like what is theater and what is a scene. These four photos are from the play I was just talking about uh, with the mentally retarded children. Uh, these two actors each had a role as uh, one of the, the children they had been observing, uh, a lengthy field, sort of field work uh, um, observing these, these children. And what I did was I put them into an improvisation that was so simple that you would think it's so easy. And, and the improvisation was just take off your clothes, you know. And so they, uh, that's what they did. And it evolved into the scene, uh, a three minute scene where the two of them were just taking off their clothes. And it was so incredibly beautiful and layered uh, because uh, in the end, you see uh, they get tangled in their own clothes and they start helping each other uh, amazing, uh, no language, just a uh, simple scene from improvisation. Crosstalk is a traditional Chinese comedy and Chinese aren't well known for comedy. Uh, we're terrible at comedy. Uh, I think uh, in all of our performing arts, in all of our uh, literature, uh, comedy is not a big thing, but Xiangshen or crosstalk is. It's the only 
it's the only comic form, and it's it's sort of like stand up. It's sort of like um, who's on first. Yeah, it's like that with two people, the straight and the comic. One guy's so who who's on, and the other guy's saying yeah who yeah what you know just the other, the, the 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 straight guy has very few lines, and the comic guy just goes you know it's like on a kite and goes far away. This was another thing that died while I was at Berkeley. Uh, I went back to Taiwan. I, I, me being a Shangsen or crosstalk fan, uh, I went to buy uh, new crosstalk records. And uh, the guy at the record store who I had bought from before looked at me in, with such a puzzled face. He said, what? And I said, Shangsen. And he said, what? You know, like he'd never heard of it before. It had died so totally, completely, just this art form that was just wiped off, deleted from our collective, you know, files, you know, just gone. It's like if you left the planet for five years and came back and went looking for some hip hop CDs and they, they all said, what? You know. <laughs> and hip hop had been erased, sorry, from the face of the earth. That's what happened to Crosstalk. So um, we did a, we did my first play with my theater group was called That Evening We Performed Crosstalk. And uh, I, I decided to use Crosstalk to comment on the death of Crosstalk. So we created five new Crosstalk scenes, uh, not in the historical uh, you know, uh, scenes of Crosstalk. And they, would, they were commenting on the death of tradition and the death of, uh, the death of Crosstalk. So this very, very, to me, academic uh, exercise, which took seven months to, to do, uh, we, we, we wanted to perform it in very small, you know, 100 seat houses, but our producer put us in big houses. And, and suddenly we became an incredible popular hit. And the audio tape of the show sold over one million copies. Um, and uh, the pirated edition of of the uh, audio tapes sold five times as much, they said. So what was conceived as an experimental work became a, a popular hit. And the next year, uh, we did Secret Love in Peach Blossom Land. Uh, and that play, we made it into a film in 92 that won many awards. Uh, and then we did a Taiwanese opera version in 2006. Because it is a play about two it's a play about two plays. It's a play about two theater groups who are mistakenly booked into the same theater for a dress rehearsal. Uh, and this, this I hear never happens in America, okay? <laughs> but it happens all the time in Asia. And it's still happening in, in Shanghai. The other, just last year, Secret Love and Peach Blossom Land, we were performing in Shanghai. I was doing tech in the afternoon and this group of 100 people walked on stage. You know, and someone was doing a tour of the theater, and, and, our, and our actors basically spoke from the lines of the play, saying, what are you guys doing here? Uh, you know, <laughs> can you please leave? We're doing a rehearsal. You know, and they sort of, they didn't know what was going on, and they, they wandered off. Uh, but it's Secret Love and Peach Blossom Land, two different plays. So Peach Blossom Land is a comedy. Uh, it's actually a farce, and so we, we used Taiwanese opera uh, very successfully. The audience loved it uh, in 2006. So it, this is like sort of playing with our own work. You know, it's like, um, I don't know, I guess, I guess in the West, uh, other directors get to play with uh, these works. Uh, in Taiwan and, and in China, I get to play with my own work, you know. So uh, that's a, it's a lot of fun to just sort of re rethink your own work. Then in, in 2006, we did a Beijing, uh, in Beijing we did a production that is still running to this day uh, with uh, these big stars. Um, many of you would know uh, Huang Lei and uh, Yuan Quan. And uh, from left is um, uh, He Zhong, and on the right is Xie Na. These very, I mean, when you talk about famous in China, uh, you're talking about a different scale. You know, it's like these people, they're, they host this uh, variety show that shows to like five billion a week, you know. It's, I mean, really, it's, it's not like you're talking about Super Bowl or something. It's way beyond that, 
you know. Uh, it's, it's a scale that is really astounding. But this production, uh, on and off, because they're so, they're famous and they're busy, but we've managed to come to almost 300 performances all over China of this play. Uh, and it's sort of brought a new awareness uh, about what theater can possibly be to China. Um, I don't know if Stanford is a dirty word around here, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's OK? All right, thank you. Uh, but I did an English version at Stanford in 07, some of you saw. Uh, I, I got a big kick out of it. The, uh, the script that I translated is, has now been published in this Columbia anthology of uh, modern Chinese drama, which is like this big, uh, really huge. It's beautiful, uh, really, really, Chen um, uh, uh, Xiaomei really did, did a great job in putting this anthology together. So um, I really recommend it very strongly. Uh, but I guess the play proved it it had its, uh, <clears throat> it can be performed in English. Uh, I would close my eyes during the performance and listen to the audience and feel that it was like I was in Taipei or something like that. You know. So over the years I've done a lot of uh, Western works also, like uh, one of my favorites, Samuel Beckett, uh, putting him in this ancient garden in Taipei, uh, six different uh, short plays like play uh, this is like a Chinese ancestral uh, altar for this well-known work. Footfalls, uh, which I turned into sort of a, a very meditative no performance. And I put Mozart into an opium den. <laughs> uh, love this opera. Um, I put, as you see, I put the uh, orchestra behind in the back, because this was this was done. Uh, they call them semi-staging, but we don't we don't like that term, you know. So we went all out, uh, and in the concert hall, the national concert hall, we put the orchestra behind. Now this come to this. I really love this poster. Uh, from that short time I had at Berkeley in early two thousand working on the play called A Dream Like a Dream. Um, so these collaborative efforts are really dear to me. Um, this is a play that uh, sort of came to me when I was traveling in India. The outline of it came to me. Uh, and once I got back home to, to type out the outline, it turned out to be 29 pages. Outline, 29 pages. So. You know, normally for me, I know three pages is a play. So 29 pages, what is this? You know, so it turned out to be an eight hour play. Uh, and we did three and a half hours here at Berkeley uh, in Zellerbach. Uh, we didn't, we weren't able to get swiveling chairs. So everyone sat on the, on the floor, uh, hippie style. Uh, everyone brought cushions and uh, just, it was, it, was, it was fine, it was nice. So um, this, led to uh, this, let's see, February 20th, yeah. This led to our productions in Taiwan uh, at the National Theater. First at my school, the National, uh, Taipei National Institute, University of the Arts in 2000, and then later at the National Theater in 2005. And uh, this performance is, uh, this is very special. Uh, I hope to do it again soon, but it's tough. It's like you need, you need 30 actors, and you, on, you can only have 250 in the audience. You know, it's like uh, producer's suicide, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you have to, uh, and it's very complicated, too. So if you, if you start teching it in the theater, doing technical rehearsals, it takes like three or four times as long as the normal play, because it's long. Just because it's that long a play, you need that much time, more time to, to tech it. It goes from... The Taipei version goes from Taipei, uh, then to Europe, to France, then to Shanghai, then to France past, and Shanghai past and France past. It's, it's like a journey. Uh, it's a journey into 
the memories of characters and, that, and it goes beyond their memories to other characters. The reason why it's so long is because it's predicated on, on the fact that um, if you really want to tell someone's story, you might have to go through the stories of other people. You know, so if you, and then, same, if you want to go through the stories of other people, if you want to do it right, you have to tell their story right. So that's why it's such a long story. And in the end, uh, the main character uh, who has an uh, undiagnosable disease, and this is something I read about in the New York Times uh, that I didn't know about, is that there are more and more undiagnosable uh, terminal illnesses in the world, uh, which means that the doctor tells you you're going to die. And uh, why? Sorry, we, we don't know, you know, but, you know. So, um, to me it's, you know, I mean, I put myself in that position and say, how would I feel? And that's how this play uh, sort of came to be, with the main character searching for uh, some sort of, uh, sort of a justification or sort of any explanation of why he would be uh, the way he is. So uh, in many ways, it's very basic and simple staging. You bring, out a, you bring out a hospital bed and it's a hospital. You put a chair there and someone brings out a chopsticks and you're in a restaurant. You know, it's just very simple. Uh, it's everything I learned here at Berkeley. But put in such an interesting staging where it's always moving around you, uh, we found that to be very, a lot of fun because uh, uh, the play starts so simply is that the whole cast comes out and starts circling the audience. They're just walking. And then, to the rhythm of the live uh, band, they start running for no reason. And then, they slow down and start walking again. It takes about two and a half, three minutes, and then they stop and they tell a story. And many of the audience says they're already in tears at that point. And uh, I say that was too easy to. <laughs> but it is very, there's something very powerful about just watching people walk, you know, and just walk around and around and around and then start running and for no reason and then they start walking again and then they stop. Uh, and that's how the play starts. Uh, and then they, they sorry, they tell us, tell a story together. Uh, and I'm not going to get into all eight hours. So I'll have to show you sometime, okay? We'll have to do it. We'll have to perform it. Um, but it is, does get into elaborate historical, um, like, like I said, Shanghai past. Uh, the main character in the first half is the patient uh, who has the disease. In the second half, it's this woman who's a, a prostitute in Shanghai. Uh, and she becomes the main character. And these are all things we developed in Berkeley uh, while I was here. And finally, we come back to the, the patient. So uh, this is one thing that I, I'm striving now to uh, build theaters in, in China and in Taiwan that will be suited for a play like this. Uh, in Taipei, we're building a new, new performing arts complex. And I was very touched when the city government, when the, uh, the they call it the brief they gave to the architects for the competition, uh, specified that one of, the one of the buildings was to be a flexible space for 800 audience. And all the architects said, what is, I mean, nobody builds a flexible space for 800. It's only for one or 200, you know. But uh, the ones who understood, really understood that this was for a dream like a dream. You know, this building is for a dream like a dream. And it's being built right now. So it should be done in maybe three years. And, We'll see. And I've been asked to design some theaters in China, and I said, would you be willing to do something that, you know, is basically for this, this sort of format, audience in the middle play revolving around? And many people are very receptive to that idea. So I think soon, within five years, we'll probably have a few theaters that can just do this kind of theater. Otherwise, it's a real headache to put this in a, in a theater, yeah. Um, like, if you look at this, configuration. This is on the stage of the National Theater in Taipei. Uh, and this wouldn't happen in America because the fire marshal would come and say, everybody out, you know, you, audience, you can't sit here. Uh, 
and we were going to do it in Singapore. And I, I challenged the head of the, uh, like the National Theater there, it's called the Esplanade. I said, you guys can't do this. You're, you, you know, only in Taiwan with our sort of flimsy laws we can do this. You know. <laughs> flimsy and flimsy interpretation of the law, we can do this. Uh, in Singapore, sorry, you're you know, very legal-minded, you can't do this. And then suddenly, he, 10 minutes later, he said, I got it. I said, what? On the tickets we will print in fine print. On buying this ticket, you acknowledge that you are part of the performance. <laughs> and he said, we'll pay the insurance for this and everything. Hmm, I said, smart. You know, we haven't done it yet in Singapore, but at least this is a clue. Uh, being in America for the, for the village, again, I'm, I'm really amazed at how, at how difficult you know, people are making it to, to do theater. You know? It's so difficult. It's so, the unions and everything, and you can't do this, you can't do that. And, hmm. I heard uh, my, our friends at Stanford say they have a real genuine problem now because they're, they're not even being allowed to use their uh, rehearsal studios or classrooms now. The fire marshal has shut everything down at Stanford. They don't even have a place to, to do classes. It's, you know, it's some a conspiracy, huh? So um, I love these collaborations. I, I went to the Shanghai Drama Academy and did a, uh, a short play in this configuration with them uh, that led to a play called Stories for the Dead at Stanford where I, where I taught for two years, uh, two half years, let's put it that way. Um, and that led to this play called Like Shadows with my, with my own group. So Shanghai in Chinese, Stanford in English, and then finally we move it back to Taipei to, to my home court. And uh, we did this uh, play uh, using a lot of uh, the new technology of projectors and everything. Uh, so, again, hard to describe. One day we'll, we'll, we'll do it for you. Uh, it's a play I'm very fond of. So, where does all the inspiration come from? Basically, just living. Living in Taiwan. Uh, this is election time in Taiwan. Crazy. Uh, so we put it into our plays <laughs> directly. And we get come to the village where, again, life determines content to me. Um, the village is about military dependent villages in Taiwan. 1949, 700,000 uh, military personnel came from China to Taiwan, uh, fled to Taiwan. Uh, Chiang Kai shek was defeated brought his troops over, and the 700,000 military personnel had to have a place to live. So they built these very simple uh, and flimsy housing and small for these people who thought that they would be going home soon. They all thought that uh, soon we will recover the mainland you know, and defeat Mao. You know. Of course, that never happened. So what was temporary housing became permanent. And these people who longed to go home were denied the, the chance of going home for years and years and years until 40 years later, finally, they were allowed to go home. Uh, so this is, uh, and then the, the, the villages started to get uh, um, dismantled and, and finally were getting these people into better housing, you know, high rise housing. Until today, there are only three villages left. But this remarkable passage of history uh, with the demolition of the villages uh, would probably certainly have just been forgotten, you know, because it's just an asterisk in, in this, whole, uh, this whole tremendous uh, passage of Chinese history in the 1940s. Uh, but um, in Taiwan, this television producer, uh, Wang Weizhong, who is a good friend of mine, he's from one of these villages, and he said, Let's do a play about the, the villages. I said, don't look at me, you should do it. You, know, you, have, you have all your you know, resources, you go ahead and do it. He said, no, 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 you have to do it. And I said, why? And he said, no why, it's just you have to do it. You know? uh, and I said, just do, you do, uh, 
you do it. And he kept telling me story after story after story. He would call me and say, are you in Taipei? I said, yeah, okay, I'm coming over. And he's very, very busy. He's like, I mean, he's, this guy is like this mogul of Taiwan TV. And uh, he would just start telling me stories and stories and stories until we got to, we compiled, there were like over a hundred stories, wonderful stories from about 25 families. And I said, look, this is set up for television. You just do it, do your television thing. And then he said something that really got me. He said, TV is fast food, you know. He says, only in the theater is the possibility of doing something eternal. <laughs> so, I don't know about that, but you know, he, he knows how to talk. You know, he certainly knows how to, how to talk, and I said, I'll think about it. And I did think about it, um, and think about these pictures from historical pictures. Even though I never lived in one of these village, villages, uh, many of my friends did, and I visited them often. Uh, displaced people. Uh, people who come, came from a long way. It's like, you know, people from all over America uh, suddenly were living in Cuba, you know, and not able to go home, something like that, for 40 years. Uh, and, and it was so close and tight that uh, Mr. Wong, he said, he, he thought he was raised by four different mothers because he could go home to anywhere and have dinner, you know, because it was so small and so, I mean, in this space you would maybe have eight families and you can smell what they're cooking and, and the accents are all different, they're from all over China. Uh, you have to learn the language and the accents and the dialects and the food, you know, some spicy, some not, some sugary, you know, and, and, and that's how they all grew up. Uh, in this, this is actu an actual photo from one of the villages. Uh, and this is after, the first generation is getting old. So one day, uh, the 100 plus stories and the 25 families somehow found a way in my mind to become dissolved into three families and the structure that uh, uh, is now the village, the play called the Baodao Yichun, which is the village. Uh, and th these are scenes from the play. Uh, when I first decided, let's do this, um, my wife, who is my producer uh, and produces all my work, said, how many actors? We're all, you know, budget conscious these days. I said, I can't see this with less than 25. And then they went and had a meeting and they said, can you do it with eight? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I'll try with 16, you know. <laughs> And it finally turned out 22, you know, and, and, we, and we opened at the worst possible time, which was December 2008. But since then, this play has just, has played to sold out houses everywhere. Um, in Cupertino, we did our 99th performance. We're coming up to 100. And uh, particularly in China, where we, we never thought the audience would, could uh, uh, really have an affinity for the, all of the subject matter. Uh, we get a, an amazing uh, sort of reception uh, and people are writing amazing things about the work. Uh, bloggers say, uh, after seeing this play, who could think of uh, sending missiles to Taiwan, you know? Uh, and I think, okay, I mean, I've seen a lot of uh, uh, critics writing uh, critiques and everything, but this one touches my heart, you know, really, because if we do a play and it really makes someone think that way, why not? Uh, even in Taiwan, where there's uh, um, not too much, sometimes we lack understanding of uh, mainland, mainlanders uh, and Taiwanese. Uh, we had a blogger say, uh, when I was young, my family told me that when the mainlanders came, they took all the resources, uh, and we Taiwanese were left to be so poor. And uh, after seeing this play, I suddenly realized there were such a big group of mainlanders uh, who had such a tough time too, you know. So in, even in Taiwan, we're getting this dialogue between different uh, groups and performing in China, uh, the Chinese uh, audiences are seeing that, wow, this is, uh, this is what happened to these guys. You know, they, don't, they, they had no idea. Uh, they, it's like seeing people leave in 1949, seeing them come back in 1988, 
Uh, and when they came back, they were allowed to visit their homeland for the first time in 39 years, and all of them brought back the prescribed gifts, which were, they would call them the three big items and the five little items. That was, you know, this is the terminology that we use. The three big items would be a television, uh, a refrigerator, and I'm not sure, what forgot what the third one was. I think a washing machine, Mo uh, or a bicycle, maybe. I don't even think a motorcycle at that time, yeah. Yeah, but anyway, um, they would come back with these, uh, with these gifts and everyone would think, oh, they had such a great you know, life in Taiwan. But the fact is, many of these military uh, men, they, would, they, maybe, they went back home, maybe the suit that they were wearing was borrowed, you know, and they used their whole life savings to buy these three things. Uh, and this is something that the audience, only until this play, they could, they could start to understand. Uh, and then the camaraderie within such a cramped uh, quarters uh, and what happens to the second generation as they grow up and they leave the, the village and the persecution that we get and the incredible stories of uh, people apart and united after 50 years. Uh, all I can say is um, in using Mr. Wong's stories and melding to them together with my own memories from my childhood, uh, this turned out to be sort of a, a tribute to my parents' generation, uh, which has probably uh, had the worst time of any generation in history. Um, my, my parents, uh, my mother telling me that, you know, her childhood was basically just uh, all, all sorts of um, uh, sirens and uh, air raid air raids and just uh, uh, dodging, you know, bombs and everything. And uh, then going to Taiwan and not being able, able to go home. Uh, you don't get stories like these very often. And the really uh, scary thing is that um, it's, it's very possible that such, such a passage of history could totally be wiped out and no one would even remember it. Uh, if, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not trying to get credit for anything, but, but the fact that Mr. Wang was so adamant uh, in saying we have to do this, uh, and we did it, and, and suddenly villages have become like sort of fashionable now. You know, <laughs> it's like uh, you have a village-style uh, restaurants now sprouting up in Taiwan, and you know, village-style cooking. You know, uh, and um, people remember, and the younger generation says, "Oh, this is what it was like." Uh, this generation, which is slowly, actually quickly, becoming disengaged from 1949, which 1949 to us has always been the, the, the crucial year in, in Chinese history and the year that changed everything. But the young generation these days doesn't know too much about 1949, nor do they care. So uh, a play like this, I've, I felt very privileged to uh, be able to write about my own recent history. Uh, and uh, judging by the reaction, which has been uh, really, really tremendous, uh, people enjoy it. Uh, it's, there have been literature about villages written before, but it's, it's usually very, very dark and very, very uh, suffering and sorrowful. Uh, and we did something, as Shannon said, very light, uh, because I say, come on, the background is already dark and suffering. And then you want to put in all this dark and suffering stuff. You know, I'm sorry. I don't think anyone wants to see that. You know. But if you do something light and funny and, and, and you see how these, these people are dwarfed by this uh, background, or this dark and suffering background, you know, it's a whole different feeling. And that's why people say they, they cry while they laugh. It's, it's a very funny funny sort of experience watching this play. Uh, and one, one guy said, uh, um, I started laughing after one minute and I started crying after two minutes. And then I didn't, I never stopped either. He said, I never stopped either for three hours. Uh, it's, it, I don't know, it's one of those rare plays that uh, touches people in, 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 a, in a big way. So, uh, I think I've covered a lot. 
this afternoon. Um, we're approaching a late uh, time. Yeah. Certainly, Shannon, it's up to you. Yeah. Uh -huh. This uh, crosstalk. crosstalk in English. Crosstalk. I mean, you mean in America or something like yeah. that? Uh, not Chinese style, but but uh, American style. It's every night. You know, it's on the night on the late shows, right? It's just one person talking, though. <laughs> right. But in English, I don't know. I don't. I haven't heard of any any attempts at doing it. I did hear that one of my one scene from one of my plays was translated into English. And two professors performed it in somewhere on the East Coast, and it was people said it was very funny, you know. But I don't know. Maybe it was all you know Chinese department watching, you know. Uh, but <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's a good thought. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, well, the village had sub surtitles. We had subtitles. Um, I think there was some some information in the in the playbills, uh, but it's hard. A play like this is uh, hard to summarize. Uh, I don't know if it, if it were given to a Hollywood publicist and they put out those three lines. I don't know what they would say, you know, because it's it's pretty sprawling. Yeah, but I think uh, did it work? The surtitles? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Without the title. <laughs> uh, no, I also, it's hard for me to separate because I read a lot of things on the internet about it first. Uh-huh. Translated in English. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think we're, we were situated. Yeah. yeah. Any other? Out there, yes. Yeah, um, I was fortunate enough to catch a, a small kind of performance. And uh -huh. I was wondering, most of the characters in there, the elderly grandmother. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Can you explain a little bit more about um, her role and <laughs> like her constant appearance throughout the play? There's one character, this old uh, granny, who just walks around, uh, and she's elegant, very elegant uh, in her chungsam. Um, but these are the type of people that we knew when we were kids, you know, and they were like mysterious and elegant. And even though they were refugees and displaced, there was some sort of you know, mystique about these people. And in the play, this, this granny is, is the topic of the younger generation. They just keep saying, you know, you don't know about her? Oh, come on, you know. She's got all these martial arts, you know. She can fly, you know. She can, you know. And, and it sounds stupid, but this is, these are the type of, they really inspire kids to, you know, talk and think and just uh, go crazy in their thoughts about, you know, because uh, this woman was actually based on a real character in Mr. Wang's village who would uh, often have these big black cars come up to her little house and she would have a, she would have a, an attendant, you know, a male attendant and they, they would all say, who is, who is she? And she would disappear for two months at a time and they would all say, where did she go? And then they would say, you don't know? Come on, you should know. Where did she go? Of course, she went to the other side. You know, she's a spy. You know, she, she had this mission. You know, how did she get to the other side? Oh, come on, you know, she, she can fly. You know, it's like, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and they're serious about it. It's like, in some ways, it's, it's like um, wishful thinking for a hopeless situation, you know. But you have these elegant people that, sort of represent this sort of tradition uh, and it's and it goes deep it's like it's like some sort of Chinese uh, wisdom or, or tradition that is there even in the most difficult times yeah yes please sure I have a question about when you talk about creativity mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, fascinated by that uh, first episode you talked about that People are taking a break, and then within ten minutes, they say, "Oh, it's all over." I'm just wondering. First of all, what was that about? Okay. And of course, I have to be there. But anyways, and 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 this latest play about uh, the the village, mm -hmm. uh, it seems like 
it's not just a moment, but rather a sustained three-hour enlightenment. Yeah, right. And I just wondered, you know, how do you link this kind of creativity within a small li length of time and when it's expanded over Good long question. periods? Good uh, question. The first thing to do is to learn how to make the moments. And then the next thing, which may be even more difficult, is how to connect the moments together. You know, how to, and that's really like how to edit, you know, a very sort of disarrayed sort of piece of literature and make it into a, a, a solid piece. The scene we see here, this is when uh, the three families uh, finally can go home. Uh, and they go to three different cities. It's actually three different scenes, but uh, it took me a lot, I mean, it took me maybe, I put this off. I didn't want to think about this scene because I knew it was so important. And so as I was developing all the other scenes, it was in the back of my mind and I was saying, how are we going to do this? I don't know how to do this because we're going to have to do three different scenes, you know. And then one, I remember when we did this uh, in the studio, it was dinner break. And I, was, I just didn't take my dinner. I just sat there looking at the empty studio. And then it suddenly came, came upon me. It's so simple. Let's just put three chairs there and, and then put three pools of light and that's three different cities and let's have them come in one, one by one. Uh, and I called and everyone didn't have their dinner that night. Because I just said, fast, you know, I've got it. You know, we got to do this now. So everybody came back and, we, and I just directed them to do this and that and everyone took it down and then we took dinner. So it's, it's a moment like that is when it sort of clicks, you know, you understand that, the, yes, this is how you can do it. But this is only one moment, you know, and there's so many moments in a, in a, in a play, and, and then there's so many that you have to discard also. They may be beautiful moments, that, but they don't fit in the whole structure of the thing. So I think the main thing is uh, you need to be able to extract the moments from the actors and from the situation. At the same time, you have to have the ability to, uh, to be able to organize structures to write, to write a, to a very coherent outline. And, and then, well, the village, you know, it, it's got, it's like a piece of architecture. It has its, uh, you know, columns and its beams and um, it's set up that way. And then you have to adhere to that. Because when you start improvising, it can go to a different, go all the way. You know, I, I once uh, described doing Secret Love in Peach Blossom Land in 1986 as building a house with the actors. And then when we got to the fourth floor, we discovered something amazing. So we had to, originally it was a six-story house. We had to take it, all, the, all the four floors down and then do it again and, take, and go to the third floor and then branch out and do a seven-floor thing on the other side. So it's like, it's like that. You, know, you, can, you can move in, you can think you're doing something right, and then it grows into something beautiful that you never thought of. And then you have to really just take your whole structure apart and then build it again. You know. But that's, those were the old days. These days, uh, my actors don't have time to play with me that long. Uh, and so I have very strict structures that I, in my outlines that I give to the, to the actors. And, and so they, in a way, they're also, uh, they feel more secure too. Because in the old days, they had to have a lot of guts to work with me. You know, because you really wouldn't know what, where it would go. Yeah. Yes. In this play? Yeah. Uh huh. Um, I noticed that you use. Um, I noticed that you use both. Um, you use Song Hua Jiang which is a very popular anti-Japanese song during the nineteen thirties. Yeah, um, it's a war song. Both at the beginning uh. of the play and also at the end of the play. So I wonder why you pick this particular song. Uh, mm. Why it is, you know, the particular song that could uh, cause you know, emotional. You know, that song though, in in uh, younger Taiwanese, they don't know that song. Yeah, uh, I found that in in China, people all know that song. You know, it's uh, it's about it was everyone knew it during the war because it was uh, it was sort of a rallying song against the the Japanese invasion. Uh, but in the play, I think it's, uh, the question is easily answered because it, it was the right song to use in the situation, you know, and the situation being uh, the first 
New Year's Eve uh, dinner away from home. And then someone starts singing that song. I needed a song that someone had to sing, and so I picked that one. I think it was the appropriate one. Yeah. And, and that's what playwriting is all about, is putting the right pieces in the right place. You know, I, I often say if, if everything that everyone says is logical, then you probably have an okay play, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yes? Have you, had plays that haven't, have you had plays that haven't worked, and uh, if so, why? Actually, I've been quite fortunate that most of my, I think most of them work, uh, some to a lesser degree. Um, there was one play I did in 1998 called uh, uh, I, Me, He, and Him that didn't work and didn't work and didn't work in, in, in rehearsals uh, until the cast, which was my closest actors, they revolted, they mutinied and said, and they said, uh, you, you sit there, we'll do this, yeah. And I loved it because I, was, I wasn't in a good state, you know, and I wasn't functioning, uh, I wasn't on the ball. And, and I'm trying this and trying that and doing this and doing that until they got tired. They got tired of me. And they were, uh, they'd been with me long enough to say, uh, you're not, good not in good shape. You know, just sit there and watch us. We'll, we'll do this. And uh, they did it beautifully. They helped carry the play through to the final stages of creativity. And then I took over again. And it turned out to be a, a very wonderful play. Yeah. But it usually works. I, I don't know. It's just um, a lot of uh, positive thinking. You need a lot of positive thinking. And you have to think that it's going to work. You know? And then it works. <laughs> Yes, please, here. Maybe this will be the last question. Yeah, OK. Life determines content, but it's not your own experience in the village. It's from Mang Wei Zhong. Uh, so what's the challenge to emphasize those people uh, since you don't have the experience? There? Well, but saying life determines the content, meaning the life around us, too. You know, if you're in, you're, if you're in touch with what's happening, you know, something's happening in Tunisia. You know, what, what, what's going on, you know, and does that have anything to do with, with me? And of course, coming from Berkeley, you know that everything has to do with everything, right? <laughs> I mean, really, that's the greatest thing I learned from, from being here is that we're all connected. And you have to be in touch. And once you're in touch, there's really no boundaries. You know, there's no borders. You, you can't say, oh, uh, Stan never lived in a village, therefore he's not qualified to write this play. Not true. You know, because, because uh, well, you know, we could talk for hours about this, but to me, I think the basic con connectivity, you have, to, you have to be in touch. And, and this is probably the most precious thing I learned from, from my five years here, you know, is that um, no matter what, I mean, we're, this moment that where we're all here together is not, a, is not a random moment. You know, there's so many, so many things have to happen for all of us to be in this one room. You know, it's mind-boggling. It's mind-boggling to the point where you would say, oh, it's random, you know. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's amazing. And a play is an amazing thing. If, it, if you can make it have a life of its own, uh, a play that has a life of its own means it has, it has an organic form and it, it's able to breathe and, and has a heartbeat and, and it's not easy at all. So to create stuff like that, we really have to be connected to everything, you know. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but to me, I think uh, it's something I really wanted to say today because uh, yeah, that's about this place. And uh, that's why I always enjoy coming back here. So thank you very much. It's been great. Thank you. Yeah. I also want to thank uh, Michelle Rabkin and Caverly Carey, who have, decided, who have made, made, the, made it possible for us to gather here today, for Stan Lai to provide the excuse to gather, to, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and also um, uh, uh, to, to all of you for taking the extra time on, that, on the first day of class. Yes. I know it was um, hard to be here. Let's celebrate together it, with a little, little nosh, a little something um, as you go out. Thank you once Thank again. You. Thanks. Thanks again. Thank you.